Hi everyone. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank um, you know the organizers for inviting me to speak today on a topic that in many ways has shaped who I am today and has shaped my experience as a human being. I'm Sami. I'm a Palestinian member of the BDS movement here in the Netherlands. Um, as I sat down to prepare for the speech today, I, I felt as I usually do whenever I need to kind of prepare something and speak in front of an audience about Palestine, which is, I felt quite stuck. I wasn't sure where to begin, and I wasn't sure what I can say that hasn't been said by all the Palestinians before me. I started thinking to myself, why is it that I have a problem doing this whenever it's about Palestine, but when it comes to other topics, it seems to come much easier. Um, and I started to realize, actually, you know, what I was feeling is something that a lot of my Palestinian comrades have mentioned that they felt as well whenever it came to talking about these things in Europe. And it's just like, it's this feeling of exhaustion. Because, you see, every time a Palestinian has to stand up and talk about Palestine in front of an audience, we have to reopen old wounds. We need to tap into generational trauma. And we need to continuously relive our pain in an attempt to rehumanize ourselves in the eyes of those that see us as the other. Because for the last 75 years, as the Palestinian, or we, the Palestinian people, have been going through repetitive and systematic cycles of loss and mourning. For the last 75 years, we've lost our homes, our land, and our loved ones. But you know what we haven't lost? Our resilience. We're continuously dehumanized as our oppressors and their powerful allies here in the West stop at nothing to erase us, to erase our history, to erase our story, to erase our struggle for justice. But we remain steadfast in our fight for justice. Just last month, Ursula von der Leyen, the EU commissioner, posted a video online celebrating 75 years of so-called Israeli independence. In her speech, she blatantly spreads lies and propaganda, claiming that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Um, and she obviously peddled the usual anti-Palestinian trope that Israel made the desert bloom, as if you know all of the olive trees, the olive groves, the orange groves, and all the amazing veggies and, and ingredients that go into making Palestinian food so rich and so delicious did not exist before 1948. Completely erasing all of the love and effort and time that has gone into the cultivation of the land for decades and even centuries by the Palestinian people. And yet, we remain steadfast in our fight for justice. When the Zionist settler colonial project was first put into action over 75 years ago, more than 700,000 Palestinians were expelled from their homes and land, marking the beginning of what we call the Nakba, or the catastrophe in Arabic. Throughout much of 1948, Zionist militia forces armed by the European powers made their way through the land, bringing entire towns and villages to the ground and massacring their inhabitants, such as the massacre of Deir Yassin and quite a few others. Their one mission was to ethnically cleanse the land of its indigenous population in order to create an ethno-state that they claim was promised to them by God. Because, you know, God personally comes down and hands out deeds to everyone. Now, I'll let you in on a little secret, which I'm sure is going to shock many of you. Shocking. I hold on to your seats. The promise of a Zionist state was, in fact, not a divine decision. And actually... It was an agreement made in 1917 between Zionist leaders and the British Foreign Secretary at the time, Lord Balfour, who was a staunch evangelical Christian. And hold on to your seats, because this is going to knock you off of all of them. <gasps> a colonialist. Who would have thought? Of course, when the British signed the Balfour Declaration, deciding to create a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine, the Palestinian people were shockingly not given a choice in the matter. As the Ottoman Empire was collapsing, the Brit and Britain was given the mandate over Palestine, the British government single-handedly decided the fate of an entire population. It wasn't until the late 1930s when a weapons shipment for Zionist paramilitary forces was intercepted at the port of Jaffa that the Palestinians realized what was actually going on. 
This naturally sparked a popular uprising amongst the Palestinians against the British mandate and against any hostile takeover of our land. By 1947, the number of Euro European Jewish settlers moving to Palestine multiplied. The newly formed UN General Assembly drew up a partition plan splitting the land into two states, with 56% of it going to these Jewish settlers who came from Europe, although they only owned 6% of it. And so began the Nakba. And on the 15th of May, 1948, with the backing of the US, the UK, and France, shocking again, the so-called State of Israel was officially established. However, the Zionist project was far from complete. Today, the Zionist state controls the entirety of the historical land of Palestine. A horrible separation wall cuts through the land. Jewish-only roads and areas have been created, the West Bank is peppered with illegal settlements, leaving Palestinians in around 115 Bantustans and their movement restricted. Gaza has become the world's largest open-air prison, with over 2 million inhabitants under siege on a strip of land that is no more than one and a half times the size of Amsterdam. Palestinians are placed under military rule, while Israelis, including those living in the illegal settlements in the West Bank, live under uh, democracy. Palestinian children are regularly arrested and tortured in Israeli prisons. I mean, the list of crimes against humanity goes on. I can literally spend hours just talking about the crimes committed in the last few days or few weeks. Yet, Dutch politicians, universities, and institutions continue to tread the bullshit line of balanced debates, a two-state solution. And of course, but it's complicated. So today, I'd like to help all of those who find the situation complicated. You know, I'm sure Ursula von der Leyen finds it complicated. You know, Rutte finds it complicated. So I'm here to help. I have five simple points, which I hope will clarify things for all. First of all, Israel is a European settler colonial project. Israel is not a democracy, but an apartheid state. The two-state solution is and has always been a fallacy. You cannot have a balanced discussion about an unbalanced situation. And finally, the Netherlands will never be the self-proclaimed beacon of equality and human rights so long as it supports the Israeli occupation of Palestine. Today we watch the most right-wing government in Israel's history, which, I mean, says a lot given their history, uh, murdering innocent civilians every day. Women, children, the elderly, just arbitrarily murdered by wild military rampages or by state-sanctioned pogroms. The impunity reaching new heights. Yet, it's business as usual for the Dutch-Israeli relationship. And actually, business is the reason why the Dutch government refuses to take a stand against Israel's continuous violation of human rights. It's a very, very, very simple thing. It all comes down to capitalism. It all comes down to trade agreements. It's the fact that the occupation is so profitable, is so lucrative for all those involved, that the Dutch government and the EU will always prioritize trade over the lives of Palestinians. I mean, we are the other and the lesser at the end of the day. Sometimes even putting their own citizens at risk as we saw with a scandal around Elbit Systems phone tapping software last year. For those that don't know, um, there was a scandal last year regarding the phone tapping system that the Dutch police have been obliged to use by the Ministry of Justice. Um, this system is created by Elbit Systems, an Israeli company, kind of one of the main players in the whole military industrial complex. And the problem with Elbit's system is the fact that it was a black box, which meant that the police had no idea how this thing operated. They had no idea where all the information that was gathered would go. They were just told that they had to use it. And on top of that, it actually didn't work that well. And while the Ministry of Justice said, you have to use it because we don't have any local alternatives, the police came out and said, that's not true. We do have a local alternative, which abides by the law, whatever that means in that context. Um, where we know how it operates and we know where the data goes. EBS, a bus systems provider and the daughter company of Israeli bus company Eged, 
is another example of how the Dutch government forces us to be complicit in Israeli crimes. Eged operates the whole bus infrastructure connecting illegal West Bank settlements to Israel, um, which is technically not allowed under international law. Yet EBS is allowed to apply and win public tenders worth billions, literally worth billions. They are applying to a tender right now for the whole Leiden kind of like northern part of South Holland, where it's going to be worth a billion euros. And what I don't get is how is a company that is complicit in apartheid allowed to operate in the Netherlands? And the worst part is that we, the taxpayers, have no choice but to pay, because for many of us, that is our only mode of transport to get in and out of work or to get around the country. On the consumer level, every year our shelves are flooded with Israeli products, such as dates and potatoes. I mean, guys, potatoes. Like the Netherlands is importing its potatoes from there. Digital, for, I mean, I'm not sure if anyone knows digital, if you guys go there, but I mean, might as well not. It's a shitty festival. But anyways, they organize festivals in Tel Aviv every year. Booking.com continues to advertise and profit from Israeli homes and illegal settlements and collaboration between Dutch and Israeli universities. And by the way, Israeli universities are obliged to play a role in the occupation. They all have a mandate to provide in whatever capacity, research, development, different product services, whatever, um, to the Israeli army. So all of them are complicit. Yet the collaboration between Dutch universities and Israeli universities, I'm sure Sai can tell us more about that, Leiden, <laughs> um, you know, that continues to grow. And that's also why that's part of this whole like trade agreement. It's the research, the development, the opportunities that they get from all of this. In the words of the wise philosopher Sean Combs, AKA Jay-Z, it's all about the Benjamins. So if our government and institutions won't stand up against apartheid and, colon and occupation, what can we do to change things? To begin with, this is an easy one, I encourage everyone to speak about Palestine with their friends and families. Raise awareness and explain to them how this isn't a faraway issue that has nothing to do with you. If your government that you're voting for and your taxpayer money is going towards supporting the system of oppression. If you want to make sure to have all the facts you need, there's plenty of useful, digestible information and resources out there. A Shabaka, IMEU, Visualizing Palestine, Amnesty International's report, as well as the many other human rights organizations that have reported about this last year. And I think there's more to come. Secondly, you can get involved with the BDS movement in whatever capacity you can, even if it's just for yourself, following the guidelines on what to boycott, that's still playing a role. So for those that don't know BDS, I'm not sure how much people know about BDS, but I'll just quickly tell you who we are. Um, it's a grassroots movement that is born out of Palestine. Um, it's led by Palestinian civil society, and it aims to put nonviolent pressure on Israel until it complies with international law by meeting three demands. Ending its occupation and colonization of all Arab lands and dismantling the apartheid wall, equality for all that live on the land, and the right of return for Palestinian refugees as stipulated by UN Resolution 194. The movement focus on, focuses on intersectionality. It's built on a model that has uh, proven to be effective, and most importantly, it's Palestinian-led, which means that we are amplifying the voices of the people most affected by the situation on the ground. And finally, you can help us grow the movement for Palestinian justice across the Netherlands. Wherever you are, we can help you build a group in your local area. And if you're alone, we can connect you with others in the region and support you throughout. That's what we did with the student groups across the campuses a couple of years ago. And now they kind of, it's kind of running itself. And that's amazing. And you know, they're able to get more and more people and they're just growing. And their impact is growing because we're also now suing the universities because of the Vobfizuk from last year. They're refusing to cooperate. Um, at the end of the day, I think it's really important for everyone to remember that true change, uh, never it, it's never come from the top, right? It never, you know, the people in power will never come down and be like, all right, you know, let's make sure that we're all equal now. Let's think about justice. That never happens. True change is a wave that grows from the grassroots until it topples the oppressor and frees the oppressed. It's now more important than ever to stand together, unified under one banner, fighting for climate justice, 
queer liberation, women's rights, black lives, Palestinian liberation, Iranian and Afghani liberation, the list goes on. Because we all know that none of us are free if we're not all free. I can tell you from experience that sometimes it might feel overwhelming, you might feel helpless, but together we grow stronger, more resilient, and more impactful with every action. Ultimately, if the people in Palestine, living under occupation, who suffer blow after blow, still manage to wake up every day stronger and more resilient than ever, then we can do whatever, or we need to do everything that we can to support them. And what we're asking for as Palestinians is really not complicated. We're not asking anyone to give us anything. We're not asking for help. What we're asking is for the EU and the US to stop harming us. What we're asking for is justice. We don't need help setting up our state. We don't need anything from anyone. We just need you to stop hurting us. Barcelona, Oslo, Liège, Verviers, Belém have all taken a stand in support of Palestine this year by severing ties with the Zionist state and saying enough is enough. We'll no longer be complicit with all of this. And this is only the beginning. Like, that's what's quite exciting. You know, I mean, it has been a very intense year for Palestinians with us, with more Palestinians dying than we've had days in the year, uh, dying, murdered. Um, but actually, the support has been growing. And I really wonder, and especially now, of really seeing all these cities taking a stand, I keep asking myself, will Amsterdam, The Hague, Rotterdam, and the rest of the Netherlands join the ranks of those fighting for justice now, or are they going to wait until the very end, when the occupation apartheid system is no longer profitable for them? But one thing is for sure, that if the Netherlands doesn't act soon, it will no longer be able to call itself the beacon of peace, equality, and human rights that it continues to push around. So free Palestine, thank you. Uh, thanks so much uh, to the organizers, the International Socialists, to, to Sami for, for kicking us off uh, in such a wonderful way, uh, and to all of you for, for being here. Uh, so uh, with, with uh, Sami having uh, laid the, the groundwork um, to talk about uh, the Nagba, what it is and, and how it continues, how the Nagba is ongoing, I thought I uh, would do, in a sense, the opposite, which is to think, where did the Nagba come from? It didn't emerge out of nowhere. Uh, it wasn't a sudden event in 1948 in which, um, uh, in a, a period uh, of a year and a half to, to two years, 750,000 Palestinians were expelled from their homes, around 500 villages were destroyed, as well as a whole number uh, of, of urban centers in historic Palestine nor was it as the kind of official historical uh, revisionism would have it, uh, the outcome of war. Uh, and that sort of uh, remained the uh, uh, official uh, Israeli position, is that things happen uh, in wars uh, that are regrettable, uh, but, but what can uh, one do? And so what I wanted to do is to sort of go in the other direction. The Nagba is not only ongoing, but the Nagba also didn't uh, uh, come out of nowhere and to think about what some of its historical roots are and hopefully I'll have the time and the ability to show that I think identifying those uh, historical roots um, uh, also helps us identifying um, uh, how to think about uh, uh, Palestinian liberation and, and, and our uh, uh, position in it. So um, the Zionist movement emerges in uh, 1897 officially as an uh, organized uh, political force with the uh, creation of the Zionist organization. At the time, it's a small organization. It's overwhelmingly a bourgeois organization. It is mocked in the newspapers uh, of the Bund, a, a Jewish uh, Marxist uh, labor uh, or workers organization in Eastern Europe as uh, a group uh, of capitalists uh, trying to dress like Gentiles uh, and behaving like the people uh, oppressing them. Uh, they are uh, uh, the upper echelons of the European Jewish uh, bourgeoisie, often from Central and Western Europe, and who uh, understand the idea of building a state as their response to European anti-Semitism from a position of wishing to be integrated 
in uh, the dominant um, uh, uh, network of emerging nation states in Europe. The Dreyfus Affair, which is an affair that uh, takes place in France, in which a Jewish officer is accused of being a spy for Germany, uh, wrongfully accused, uh, a very large and uh, a years-long campaign will be fought to have him uh, exonerated, uh, will be a signal to many of those uh, wealthy, highly um, uh, assimilated uh, uh, Jewish thinkers that the promises of the French Revolution, which was that the state would be open to all of its citizens, was a lie. Uh, and that they, were, uh, uh, they remained in the eyes of the European state, fundamentally uh, considered uh, as Jews and outside of the emerging uh, boundaries uh, uh, of those states. But the way they responded to that, whereas the kind of the labor movements in Eastern Europe, like the Bund that I talked of, or the, 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 the very militant uh, um, uh, Jewish uh, communists and socialists and anarchists that made up the backbone of revolutionary movements, both in Europe and the United States, um, who reacted to European anti-Semitism by fighting against it and talking about the destruction, both of the states imposing them and of capitalism, the system that was uh, reproducing it, the response of the Zionists was to say that uh, the way out of anti-Semitism was to join the European family of nations, um, that it was uh, to recognize the anti-Semitic idea that Jews were an, uh, a nation that didn't belong amongst uh, the countries in which they lived, and that that state was to be built uh, through uh, colonial expansion. And in a sense, nothing is surprising there. As European um, uh, members of the European bourgeoisie, they thought as members of the European bourgeoisie in the late 19th century, which is to say that the internal social problems of Europe can be uh, uh, solved by expropriating people uh, in uh, the, colonial, the colonial world. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, Theodor Herzl, the, the kind of uh, central theoretician uh, and political force behind the formation of the Zionist organization, writes in his book, The Jewish State, and my apologies for not quoting Jay-Z, uh, but for quoting Theodor Herzl uh, instead. Uh, I'll work on my sources for, for next time. Herzl writes, Palestine is our ever memorable historic home. The very name of Palestine would attract our people with a force of marvelous potency. In fact, it didn't, and I'll come back to that. We should, there, uh, uh, we should therefore form a portion of a rampart of Europe against Asia an outpost of civilization as opposed to barbarism. We should, as a neutral state, remain in contact with all Europe, which would have to guarantee our existence. And so the vision is to say that to join the European family of nations, the Zionist movement will leave Europe and will uh, establish uh, a colony. We can talk about uh, why Palestine was chosen. I, I don't have the time uh, now. Uh, but in a, in a word, uh, it's much less to do with biblical narratives and much more about the key strategic position that Palestine did and continues to occupy in terms of world trade between Africa, Asia and Europe, and uh, crucially um, uh, as one of the two controlling sides uh, of the Suez uh, uh, Canal. But uh, given this bourgeois impetus for the Zionist movement, its early settlements were therefore also organized around these bourgeois lines. Uh, what do I mean by that is that people like uh, uh, Edmond de Rothschild, who's uh, one of the early financiers of settlement uh, in Palestine, looked at France's colonization in Algeria. And I think this is important because today uh, 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 allies of the Zionist movement will react uh, in sort of faux outrage at the idea that Zionism is a colonial movement. How could you possibly say it's a colonial movement? It's a, it's a movement of national liberation, uh, one which obviously takes place thousands of miles away from where the nation was oppressed, but let's put that between brackets. But the early Zionists had no such worries. They were very happy to describe their movement as colonial uh, and to learn from other colonies in terms of how they would organize uh, their own. And so... Um, uh, the early model was that of Algeria. The idea was that a minority of largely German-speaking Jewish land, uh, 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 landlords would control large tracts of land on which a Palestinian majority would work uh, for very low wages in order to extract cash crops to be exported uh, to, to Europe. So literally the Algerian, uh, the Algerian model, and it was defended as 
the, uh, uh, the Algerian uh, uh, model. Um, uh, in fact, in terms of the German thing, if you want to have an idea of how these early Zionists thought about Palestine, you should read the novel that Herzl wrote. So he wrote a political book, The Jewish State, which is very well known. And then he wrote a novel that is less well known that's called Alto Neuenland, which is the old new land in which he imagines what Palestine will be like, and it's extraordinary. Um, he imagines Austria, basically. It's green, it has rolling hills, everybody speaks German, uh, the houses are in wood with big roofs that go all the way to the floor. Um, people aren't skiing, but, you know, I think that's the kind of, uh, whatever, maybe that's what I think Austria is like. Anyway, uh, moving on swiftly. Um, against what is that early dominant wing of Zionism in the late 19th century emerges what will uh, uh, call itself labor Zionism, which is a small minority in this broad Marxist, uh, uh, Marxist or Marxist-influenced political movements in Eastern Europe that I talked about, in which uh, Jews from the very lower middle classes and the kind of uh, wealthier strata of the labor movement in Eastern Europe will see Zionism as a key aspect to make a uh, Jewish form of socialism possible. And I can speak more in the Q&A about what that means, but shortly it's a sort of a stagism in which Zionism would normalize, as they saw it, the Jewish nation, which had been uh, uh, um, uh, made abnormal by uh, uh, anti-Semitism, and that by creating a normal class structure uh, in a future Jewish state, it would lay the foundations for a normal class struggle in which Jews would be able uh, to join the family of nations uh, in the struggle uh, for socialism. There's a certain logic in there, uh, although not one uh, uh, that we might want to recognize as uh, uh, an internationalist uh, uh, form uh, of, of socialism. The problem for this wing of, Z uh, of the Zionist movement was, on the one hand, the bourgeois dominance in Palestine itself, in setting up the settlements, and on the other hand was the fact that because those settlements relied on Palestinian workers, it was very difficult to integrate uh, new arrivals uh, in Palestine new settlers who found that they were expected to work alongside Palestinian workers for Palestinian wages uh, in uh, the amount of hours and terrible working conditions that Palestinians were expected uh, to work in, and which was certainly not why they left the shtetls uh, of Eastern Europe. In fact, the vast majority of Jews went to England and to the United States where they could establish a better life, a life they were not finding in Palestine. And so up until the late 1920s, uh, there are regular years in which more Jews leave Palestine than uh, arrive. And so for all of Herzl's uh, conviction that the name Palestine would be enough to attract Jews, that was certainly not the case. Uh, and that the life that they found in Palestine uh, was, a, was an extremely uh, uh, difficult one. Um, and um, what emerges out of that is a Zionist labor movement that is going to fight for what it calls Hebrew labor, uh, also known as the conquest uh, of labor. And the idea was to create a separate uh, economy in the Yishuv, which is a Jewish settlement in Palestine before 1948, uh, in which, uh, in their words, uh, both uh, Arab workers and Arab goods would be uh, uh, excluded uh, from the Yishuv's uh, economy. And so it was a campaign that was fought both against Jewish bosses, trying to impose on Jewish bosses to hire Jewish workers on high wages and against Palestinian workers uh, for their exclusion. A whole number of institutions that become absolutely central to the formation of the Israeli state emerge out of that struggle. Um, the ancestors of the Israeli Labor Party, the ancestors of the Israeli uh, military and a number of different Zionist uh, militias, the uh, largest Israeli trade union federation, the Histadrut, which still exists today, and the kibbutz, which some people might know as wonderful socialist paradises where uh, dreamy teenagers left Europe and the United States in the 1960s and 70s to work without bosses on stolen Palestinian land, but are more accurately known that is terrifying, thank you so much, uh, are, are more accurately known uh, as the first settlements in which by doing away with bosses, the Zionist movement did away with the competition between uh, Jewish workers and Palestinian workers. If there were no bosses, the uh, farms would not be run for profit and so could be run as uh, uh, eff effectively ethnically pure 
uh, settlements in which the problem, uh, quote unquote, of Palestinian labor was done away with. The Histadot, the trade union, similarly understood its role in that way. To just read you a brief uh, bit of its constitution, it uh, uh, defined its aim in 1920 as uniting all the workers and laborers in the country, important all the workers and laborers in the country who live by their own labor without exploiting the labor of others. So far so good, normal uh, 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 working class organization. In order to arrange for all settlement, economic and also cultural affairs of all the workers in the country, so as to build a society of Jewish labor in Eretz Israel, so in the land of Israel um, uh, or, or uh, the, the whole of historic Palestine. Uh, and so that clearly the understanding of uh, what this internationalism looked like was the creation of a worker settler state, uh, which is a really, uh, and in fact, the example the labor Zionist movement would draw on is again a colonial one. They would talk about South Africa. They repeatedly pointed to South Africa and said, to build a state based on the exploitation of the indigenous population would be a catastrophe because look at what happens in South Africa, they keep rebelling. The economy is dependent on their labor, and so they keep rebelling. So if we're gonna build an economy that's based on indigenous labor, we will dig our own graves because the indigenous people will not accept uh, our, um, uh, our, our rule over them, which uh, if anything is, is insightful. Um, similar arguments were made on the right, people will probably know about Zev Jabotinsky, who famously wrote in his Iron Wall article that Zionist colonization must, must either stop or else proceed regardless of the native population, which means that it can proceed and develop only under the protection of a power that is independent of the native population behind an iron wall which the native population cannot breach. The idea was clear, if the state was to be effective, it needed to be exclusionary, it needed to uh, eliminate the problem. Uh, of uh, uh, the indigenous population. And so out of this campaign emerges the early language of transfer, which is the Zionist euphemism for expulsion, and, watch that one, and one that has not disappeared. So you will still have Israeli politicians today who talk about transfer of populations for future solutions. Um, what that means is the large expulsion of Palestinians from within the state, potentially in exchange for pulling a couple of settlers out of uh, some of the furthest outposts uh, in, in the West Bank and really in the West Bank, because it never involves uh, uh, anything else. I don't have the time, but if you're interested, no, uh, uh, Nurma Salha's book uh, on the history of transfer and the language of transfer in Zionist uh, uh, political discussion is excellent. Uh, and 47 seconds. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I recommend it uh, uh, very strongly. Uh, what to do with the 30 seconds are left? Okay, I know what I'll do. So out of this, comes from the 1920s onwards, the idea that for the state to be effective, it needs to rid itself from what it considers to be the native problem. It needs to rid itself from Palestinians. And so when Sami describes the crushing of the Arab revolt in the 1930s and then the Nagba in 1948, it's not something that emerges in a period of struggle. It's something that emerges out of a decade long process of attempting to organize an economy that will make the survival of the state possible uh, in the long term. Those debates and discussions have been uh, uh, documented in, in, in great detail. Uh, and, uh, you know, Nur Masalha's book is a, is a good place to start. Ilan Pape's book uh, on uh, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine is excellent, as well uh, as all the Khaldi's family. Uh, there's three or four of them uh, who have written excellent histories of, of the dispossession of Palestinians uh, by the Zionist movement and then the Israeli state. I'll briefly say, if I, if I may, that I think that tension between land and population remains a fundamental contradiction that you can trace throughout the history of the Israeli state after 1948, which is on the one hand that what 1948 makes possible, as much as it was ever possible in the history of the first Zionist movement in the Israeli state, is the attempt at establishing a state that is independent from the need of Palestinian labor. Uh, about 150,000 Palestinians remain within the borders of the state in 1948. They are put under military control, a military control, by the way, that the Histadot participates uh, in organizing. Uh, and uh, the land that is uh, stolen in 1948 is uh, um, uh, distributed amongst the kibbutzim who see their land uh, grow fourfold 
uh, in the aftermath uh, of, of 1949. But that period is a fairly short-lived one, and under the pressure of economic crisis on the one hand and labor shortage on, on the other, the Israeli state is going to start to expand, as we know, and control the whole of historic Palestine. And from that moment on, up until today, and then I promise I shut up, the fundamental question remains what to do with that population. Because now that more land has led to a greater Palestinian population under Israeli uh, control, you have an ongoing fight between different Israeli factions about what to do with that population. Is it about expelling it? Is it about exploiting it? Is it about controlling it? Is it about a mixture uh, of all of the above? And you can trace those debates in the aftermath of 1967, in the first intifada, in the aftermath of Oslo, in the second intifada, uh, up until uh, today. And if you're interested, you can ask me about it uh, and I'll say more, but I'll, I'll shut up now. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. Can I take the water?